Did man come from God or monkeys? That's our topic on His Voice today. Welcome to another His Voice Today with Steve Wolberg. The evolution delusion, that's our topic. I'd like to start with the very first line of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. God's book says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Going down to the book of Exodus, chapter 20, it's the chapter on the Ten Commandments, the Big Ten which God wrote with His own finger on stone. In verse 11, which is the conclusion of the fourth commandment, God says, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that in them is, and He rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Going down biblical history, all the way down to the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, chapter 14, and we've been talking about this in previous programs, talks about the three angels' messages, which are spe special messages that God has sent to the world just before the return of Jesus Christ. These messages are described in chapter 14, verses 6 to 12, and then in verse 14, right after these messages are complete, and given to the world, verse 14 says, I looked and behold a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. It's harvest time. Jesus comes to reap the harvest of the earth. So right before the harvest, before the return of Christ, we have the messages of the three angels. And if you go down to chapter 14, verse 7, we have the conclusion of the first angel, which is a special call to worship the maker of heaven and earth. The Bible says with a loud voice, Worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. In other, in other words, worship the one who made all life, the one who made you and the one who made me. This is a special call in the last book of the Bible. It's a special message which is to sound around the world right before the coming of Jesus. Uh, it is no secret that the majority, at least in the scientific community, uh, do not believe in the Genesis account. They don't believe in the Ten Commandments. They don't believe in the book of Revelation. And they don't believe what the Bible says, that God made the heavens and the earth. Uh, they believe, at least a lot of them believe, in a teaching, in a doctrine called evolution. Evolution is taught today in most public schools. It's taught in textbooks of, of all ages, all levels. It's taught in the national parks, in museums, science centers, on television, documentaries, cartoons. Uh, I was reading a book recently about vitamin D. It's a great book dealing with our need for sunshine and how vitamin D affects the whole body and how every cell has a vitamin D receptor. And as I was reading this great book, uh, talking about getting out in the sun appropriately, not, not too much, not to burn, uh, then it also talked about how we've been around for millions and millions and millions of years. And I thought to myself, are, are you sure? Uh, you've got a lot of science behind your, your book dealing with uh, nutrition and the body and the skin and the liver and the kidneys, but what about dealing with uh, evolution? Where is the science? Last December, my wife and my two little children, Seth and Abby, uh, Abby's four and Seth is eight, we were in Southern California visiting my mother. She lives in Palm Springs. And as we were driving down Highway 10, we were getting closer to my mom's house and we looked on the left side of the highway and we saw this gigantic dinosaur. I think it was a, a brontosaurus. And it was huge, advertised as the biggest dinosaur in the world. And my kids just really wanted to go over there and take a look. So we pulled off the highway and went over. And uh, I was surprised to discover that this dinosaur was actually hollow. And inside of it, there was, uh, there was a bookstore. And so we thought we'd go upstairs and take a look. And as we walked up these steps, there was a big sign right as you're going up and the sign said, is planet Earth really billions of years old? And I thought, oh, that's, that's a good question. And as I got up to the top uh, of the biggest dinosaur in the world that was advertised, uh, I was uh, pleasantly surprised 
to see Bible verses on the walls all around this bookstore talking about how in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and how he rested on the seventh day. And all these verses talking about creation and come to find out that there was a bookstore in there. There was lots of um, toys that promoted creation and the museum was actually put together by a group of creationists who were trying to enlighten the public, as Paul Harvey used to say, with the rest of the story, telling them about creation in contrast to evolution. We went in and we browsed around for quite a while and uh, bought our kids a couple of little knickknacks. And I, I looked around at the, at the bookshelf and I was intrigued, especially by this book called Darwin's Demise. Darwin's Demise. Why Evolution Can't Take the Heat. And it's written by a man named Dr. Joe White, co-authored with Dr. Nicholas Comnenellis. And I bought this book and I was uh, thrilled as I read it. Uh, I definitely recommend it. It's a good book. It's a very eye-opening. It's very scientifically substantiated. And it's, um, it's very convincing. This book deals with all of the theories, the evolutionary ideas. It deals with the Big Bang, the, the concept that a long, long time ago there was just a Big Bang. Nobody knows exactly how it happened, why it happened, and uh, apparently after millions and billions and uh, even maybe trillions of years, um, that's how you got here. That's how I got here. Just mindless forces in this universe. This book talks about uh, spontaneous generation, the idea that life just came out of nothing, uh, things like positive mutations, how uh, apparently mutations have taken place uh, in life forms and that has, has uh, improved life to eventually get to us. Natural selection, survival of the fittest, the geologic column is looked at, the different layers of sediment that you find in the Grand Canyon and around the world, the fossil record and the different creatures that are entombed in, these, uh, in the rocks and various dating methods. All of this is looked at in Darwin's Demise. And the message of this book is very clear. And that is that evolution, in spite of how scientific it sounds, it is really just a theory that really has no real scientific, uh, solid evidence for the idea. You know, I know that may sound absolutely ludicrous to you if you are an evolutionist, but if, if you are an evolutionist and if you have any interest, this book, Darwin's Demise, uh, is extremely, extremely compelling. Uh, as I read the book, there was one particular argument that really, uh, to me, was just it was just the end of all arguments. And it had to do and it, with, with two words, <clears throat> two words that are used in the book, and uh, they are incomprehensible complexity. When you boil it down and look closely at the things of creation, at the things of nature, especially inside the human body, and if you look inside the human cell, the words incomprehensible complexity definitely, uh, definitely apply. Modern evolution is largely as a result of the teaching of one particular individual, one man. Now, it's a conglomeration of different people, but uh, I think we can put the, the onus on one man. His name is Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin was a British naturalist born in 1809 and who died in 1882. 73 year old man. In the year 1859, his book, Origin of Species, hit the press and began to circulate around America and around the world. Uh, at that time, it wasn't really, evolution was not something that was really uh, strong in the scientific community, but it was growing. By the 1870s, Darwin's ideas began to take more firm root. By the 1930s to the 1950s, it was largely accepted as just a fact of life. That yes, of course, there was a Big Bang. Yes, of course, we evolved. Yes, of course, we came from monkeys. And yes, of course, uh, the Bible is not true. Now, here's the biggest problem. And if you read the book Darwin's Demise, it'll become very clear. The biggest problem is that in, in the 1850s, when Darwin's book was published and when evolution began to take root into the scientific community, uh, science was extremely primitive 
in the 1800s. You've heard the expression, we've come a long way, baby. Well, nothing uh, is truer than when it comes to science. In the 1850s, scientists, especially Darwin, he thought that the cell was simply um, a very simple matter that originally just, again, came from, came from mindless forces. He said it came together by chance from a, a primordial soup a long, long time ago. A man named Ernest Heckel, who popularized Darwin's theories in Germany, his view of the cell was that it was, it was quote, a simple lump. That's all it was. That's what he thought. Well, the reality is that today, uh, science has advanced a long way from the 1840s and 50s and 60s. There are disciplines now like biology, microbiology, molecular biology, biochemistry, genetics, uh, and, and it goes on and on and on. And as a result especially of the development of high-tech microscopes, scientists have been able to look inside the human body and they have been able to look closely at the composition of a human cell and keep in mind that there are, scientists say, somewhere between uh, 50 and 100 trillion of these little guys inside of your body and inside of mine. We all have these little cells. And as they looked inside a cell, they saw amazing things. They've seen more than they can, that they can even really begin to comprehend. The nucleus, the mitochondria, uh, all of the different components of a cell. It is absolutely, really incredible. Especially something inside the cell called, called DNA. And there are um, untold numbers of these little DNA strands inside of a human body. <clears throat> Here's a picture in Darwin's demise showing the cell and the different parts inside of a cell. And when it talks about the DNA, this is just absolutely incredible. On page 25, of Darwin's demise, it says, the quantity of information that can be stored in a pinhead's volume of DNA is equivalent to the pile, to the, to the content of a pile of paperback books spanning the distance from the earth to the moon 500 times, each book being unique from the other. So in other words, uh, there's more information in one little DNA strand that can go up and down to the moon uh, in 500 books or, or books, books up, up and down 500 times. Uh, in other words, it's practically incomprehensible. It, there is incomprehensible data and incomprehensible complexity inside of one strand of a DNA which is inside of your body. As you continue to read about this in this book, it talks about uh, the incredible complexity. The human eye, well, I've got two eyes and I, I know I'm getting a little bit up there. That's why I need my glasses sometimes. But it says here that the eye can handle 1.5 million simultaneous messages. Simultaneous means that all at the same time there's a million things that can be going on inside of my eye at the same time. It talks about the ear, the heart, the liver, the brain. The brain has 10 billion circuits and a memory of, and I can't even count all these, there's a one here followed by 21 zeros, 21 zeros. That's how many circuits and, um, and memory bits are inside of the human brain. The human brain with its 12 billion brain cells and 120 trillion connections is the most complex arrangement of matter in the universe. Uh, this book builds a case that, that uh, the incomprehensible complexity that is inside the human body and inside the things that we see around us uh, there's just no way that this could have evolved. It, it's, it's kind of like a, a tornado passing through a, a junkyard and creating a 747. Uh, the whole idea that this, all of this that just we see around us, all the complexity in the, in the sky, the heavens, the earth, the sea, uh, the human body, the eye, the brain, the ears, uh, all of the components that make up you, that this is all just the result of mindless forces of chance and chaos, you know, really, does that really make any sense at all? In the last 50 years, evidence for an intelligent designer has been growing in all scientific fields of study. Was Darwin right about our origins or is the biblical account in Genesis correct? 
Darwin couldn't have known the latest facts about the amazing complexity of the human body. Find out interesting facts in Joe Crew's booklet titled, How Evolution Flunked the Science Test. Order your free copy today by calling 1-800-782-4253, or you can write to Whitehorse Media, P.O. Box 1139, Newport, Washington, 99156. Now, what does the Bible say? Let's go back to what the Bible says about our Creator. And let's take a closer look at who really is the Creator according to the New Testament. In Colossians chapter 1, there's an amazing, this is an amazing chapter. It gets me excited to read it. Colossians chapter 1, verse 13 talks about how God has delivered us from the power of darkness and he has translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. Verse 14 talks about how we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Now verse 16 is an amazing revelation of who the Son really is. Verse 16 says, for by him, referring to Jesus Christ, by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. So verses uh, 16 and 17 tell us that, that Jesus Christ, according to the New Testament, really is the one a long, long time ago, in the very beginning of the Bible, in Genesis chapter 1, who made the heavens and the earth. And Jesus did not originate in Bethlehem. In Micah chapter 5 verse 2, it says that the one who was born in Bethlehem had an origin that is of old from the days of eternity, from the days of everlasting. Uh, John chapter 1 verse 10 tells us that when he came into the world, he was in the world and the world was made by him. But the world did not know him. The world had no idea who was actually walking the dusty uh, shores of Galilee who walked across the water, who preached in Jerusalem and who ultimately died on a cross. They had no idea. People had no idea who they were looking at. Going, going on in Colossians chapter 1, in verse 20, Paul says that Jesus made peace through the blood of his cross to reconcile all things to himself, whether things that are in heaven or things that are on earth. Verse 21 says, and you, you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now has he reconciled. Verse 23 says, if you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and do not be moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. So uh, Paul says that Jesus is really our creator. The one who died on the cross to save us is really the one who made us. And we need to hold on to this truth and not let uh, the powers of darkness take this truth away from us. And we need to remain grounded and settled and not moved away from the hope that is described in the Bible that tells us really how we got here and who our Savior is and how to get out of this life uh, into a, a much better life that we can't, even, we can't even comprehend. Now going down to verse 27, verse 26 and 27 tells us that this is a mystery. The mystery which has been hidden from generations and from the ages, but is now made manifest to the saints. Verse 27 says, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So God calls this a mystery. It's, it's beyond human comprehension. It's an incomprehensible mystery, and yet it's been revealed to us in the Bible that the one that made the earth at the very, very beginning, which we also find revealed in the Ten Commandments, is also, according to the New Testament, the one who came down here and who sacrificed his life on a cruel cross for you and for me so that our sins can be forgiven, so we can be reunited with our Creator, so that we can have the gift of eternal life and we can be with him forever and ever and ever and ever. That's what this book says, and the Bible calls this a mystery, that our Creator is actually willing to die on a cross for us, forgive our sins, and then come into our hearts 
so that Christ in you, the hope of glory, can be, can be experienced, that Jesus can actually live inside of us by the Holy Spirit. Going back to the book of Revelation, in chapter 10, verse 7, there's another amazing verse. It talks about what God is seeking to accomplish in the final days of this world's history. Verse 7 says, In the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he has declared to his servants the prophets. And that mystery is the Creator in his creatures, the Holy Spirit bringing Jesus and his love and his character into our hearts so that his character and his love and his goodness can shine out through us. Back to chapter 14. Revelation 14 tells us the amazing, the amazing message. How to get ready for these last days. Revelation chapter 14 describes three angels' messages. Three angels that are sent from God, from a holy God, to prepare a people for the return of Jesus Christ. At the heart of these messages is the first angel's message that lifts up Jesus, the everlasting gospel. We've been reading about this. Revelation 14, verse 6 says that the message of the everlasting gospel, the good news of Jesus, is to be preached to those who dwell upon the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And then verse 7, at the end of the verse, it says with a loud voice, we need to hear the call. It says, worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Worship the one who made everything. In other words, the book of Revelation uh, appeals to us not to be duped by evolutionary theory. Uh, I've done some research in the life of about the life of Charles Darwin, and uh, Darwin propagated his theories when he was a young, young man. But as he got older and older and older, uh, he began to question his own theories. And he was known to read the Bible in the last days of his life before he died. Uh, he also made a comment where, where he, was, uh, he saw how his theories had taken hold in so many people's lives and minds, and he, he said, uh, you know, I was, just, I was just sharing my theories, what I thought was right. But as... Uh, as I, as I mentioned before he, before he breathed his last breath, he started reading the book and he called it the royal book. The royal book, God's book, which teaches creation, not evolution. The first angel's message in Revelation 14 is a, contains a special call in verse 7 to worship him that made heaven and earth. It is a direct uh, challenge to evolution. God does not want us to believe that we came from monkeys. God made you in his image. It didn't, it didn't start with a big bang. It didn't go down from primordial soup. There aren't mindless forces that are, that are out there that eventually put all your trillion cells together that, made your, that put your brain together, your liver, your lungs, your heart, uh, your eyes, your ears, all the complexity, the incomprehensible incompre complexity. Even one little DNA strand. On a, the, there's as much information on a pinhead of a DNA strand as could fill books stacked up to the moon and down 500 times. There is no way that all of this just evolved. We are not here by chance. We are here as the result of a marvelous God who has a wonderful plan for you and for me and who gave his life 3, 000, or two, approximately 2,000 years ago on a cruel cross outside of Jerusalem. Uh, I have a little girl named named Abigail. We call her Abby. Abigail Rose Wahlberg. She is almost uh, five. On her fourth birthday party, we got together with some church friends and a few of her little friends. And uh, Grandma and Grandpa were there. We live in North Idaho in our home. And Grandma and Grandpa got Abby a gigantic present, which was in a big box. And she had no, no idea what it was. It was the biggest box in our house. And when the time came finally for her to open her presents, she just couldn't wait to get this big box open. And so she started ripping off the, um, the wrapping paper. And finally, she looked at the side of this box and she saw what it was. She saw a picture on the outside of a, of a big dollhouse. My little girl, she just loves dolls. Um, and I'll confess uh, that I, Steve Wahlberg, that I play with dolls too. 
And the reason why I do is because when my little girl grabs my hand and says, Daddy, will you play with me in my dollhouse? Uh, I just can't resist. I just can't resist her. Well, anyway, she looked at this package and she saw this big dollhouse and she was so excited she couldn't even believe it. And then, and then she looked at Grandma and Grandpa and we got this on, uh, we took a picture of her face. It was, it was amazing. It was so touching. She looked at Grandma and Grandpa with this uh, stunned look on her face and she said, Grandma, Grandpa. She looked down, she looked up and she said, is this really for me? Is this really for me? And of course they looked at her and said, yes dear, of course, it is for you. It was, it's all for you. I think about that little story and I can't help but think about my God becoming a man and giving his life on a cross. The one that made me dying on a cross to save me. And you, if you look at the cross and think about the cross and really understand what the cross is all about, that it's your creator who made you, who made your brain, your cells, your, your body, who made everything in this whole universe, that he's the one that gave his life on the cross to pay the price for your sins and to rise from the dead. It's appropriate to say, is all of this really for me? And the answer is yes, it's for you. God so loved the world, he so loved you, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The book of Revelation chapter 14 has a special call to the world before the return of Jesus Christ. In chapter 14, verse 7, the conclusion of what's called the first angel's message says, worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Don't be duped by evolution. You didn't come from a monkey, you came from God. He loves you. He died for you. He's coming back for you. That's what the Bible says. You have just heard His voice today. We hope you've enjoyed this timely message from Pastor Steve Wolberg, and we want you to know that Whitehorse Media is deeply committed to bringing you many more simple messages straight from the Bible, designed to educate the mind, inspire the heart, and help bring our viewers and their families closer to God. To learn more about Whitehorse Media or to watch more of Pastor Steve's television programs online, including his powerful new series of two-minute talks, visit hisvoicetoday.com. That's hisvoicetoday.com. If you have any prayer requests, you can email them to us at prayerrequests at hisvoicetoday.com. If you would like a free copy of Steve Wolberg's audio CD, Behold a White Horse, you can call us at 1-800-78-BIBLE. That's 1-800-78-BIBLE. We hope you will join us next time for another inspiring His Voice Today presentation with Steve Wolberg.